love that video because you can read the genealogy a lot or you can hear it, especially at Christmas. And what I love about that video is that it puts faces at least in our mind. And obviously they didn't look like that. But they were people, flesh and blood people who came from a mom and a dad and who lived stories out and God met them. And some of them in that genealogy said yes to God and changed everything. Some of them said no to God. But God said, I'm going to bring my son through them. A few thousand years ago, there was a group of people who had believed and trusted in Jesus. And they weren't really sure where this story was going. He had lived, Jesus had, at that moment he had died, and he'd even been resurrected. And they had gathered with other Jews at the time, um, other Jews who didn't believe in Jesus, and all of a sudden, God started working. God started working, and it looked really strange, to be honest. So much so that people started doing things and acting in ways where the observers were like, I'm pretty sure they're drunk. And Peter, one of them, he stood up and he started to preach, and he preached, in my mind, the best sermon ever in Scripture outside of Jesus. And he starts with the greatest line a preacher could ever open with. He starts, he says, people, they're not drunk. Which, hey, as a preacher, if I ever have to say that about you guys, I'll be a little proud, okay? <laughs> hey, guys, refuge is awesome. I promise you, they're not drunk. And then he starts to preach and tell them about who God is. And many of the folks who were listening, they had been in on crucifying Jesus, like shouting for him to die. And they repent, and they say yes to him, and their lives change, and it says they, they scatter, they're dispersed, because so much, um, so much power comes on them that people start saying yes to God all over Jerusalem, and the religious establishment starts to persecute them. So many of them go back to their land that they came from. Some of them go to this place called Antioch. Antioch at the time's in Greece, it's now in, in, in present-day Turkey. And there they start to live out this faith that they heard. They're, they're, they're so focused on trusting God and wherever he sends them and whatever they do that the observers go, you know what we're going to call them? Christians. They didn't self-name them that. A newspaper that was, you know, um, doing a survey didn't name them that. The observers of the day called them Christians and literally what they were calling them were little Christ. They looked so much like Jesus that the people in Antioch said they look like little Christ. Some of those people in that genealogy, they don't have the greatest story before God meets them. But they give their life over to him. And even though it's before Jesus, they start to look like little Christ. See, at Christmas, we don't, we don't worship a story that's just sentimental, that's just feel good, that's just tradition. We worship a story that's changed lives for thousands and thousands of years. That, that in really like um, dire circumstances thrives. And in this series, we call the birth of I am. We're looking at exactly why it changes everything. That when Jesus is born... He doesn't come with just an empty story. He doesn't come with just a, a, some promises that we'll see if it does anything. But that he comes with a resume and that we get to sit on this side of his story where it changes everything. So what I want to do is I want to read you a passage where Jesus is introducing himself, telling himself to his followers who he is, telling himself to us, telling him to us who he is. We'll see just why Christmas is so revolutionary, so transformational. I'm going to read the passage to you first, and then we'll break it down as, as, as I um, talk through it. So just take it in. This is in John 15. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Anytime we talked about it last week, Jesus says, I am. He's making a divine statement of who he is. He's saying, I am eternal. I am God. 
He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. If you're like, Kyle, I can't grow anything. I've killed everything I've ever put in, in, in soil. Um, I don't understand this. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it, okay? You are already clean, he says, because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I and you. See, this is an invitation. He's saying, I am the vine, my father is the gardener, and I want you to be a part of this, like to be united with us. He says, neither, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. But he says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My father is glorified in this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. He says, as the father has loved me, I've also loved you. Think about that for a second. As God loves Jesus, so Jesus loves us. Remain in my love, he says, if you keep my command, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. He says, I have told you these things, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. See, Jesus is about ready to go to the cross at this moment. And he's gathering his disciples and he's saying, come know a new way to live. Like, come know an absolute unity with me and the Father, and the Spirit. He even says to them in this conversation, he says, I'm going away, but that's actually going to be better for you. Because my Spirit is going to be alive in all of you. And then he says that first word, he says, I am, meaning I am God, and I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He's inviting all of us to be in union with him. When I lived in Orange County, I, I got to know a wine grower. And I'm kind of fascinated by this experience, especially because where I lived growing up, no grapes grew. Like, I lived in the mountains, I lived up high. Like, I, I found out later you can grow certain grapes in those regions, but nobody grew grapes. And so I moved to Orange County, and I got to know this wine grower, and I got to ask him about the process and what it was like. He got to talk to me about what it was like to, to graft branches in to a vine. Some of you maybe even grow and do this kind of stuff. And he says, at first, it looks crazy that you're going to take a branch from somewhere else and you're going to unite it with this vine and it's going to become one. But after a while, after some time, you don't even know that it used to be distinct. See, Christmas is a big deal because Jesus, this, this, this baby that we worship who grows up to be a man that proclaims himself the Messiah, he says, come and know me. And be united with me and the Father and my Spirit. See, we can be grafted in. True union. And the reason why we celebrate that at Christmas is it's the birth of something. It's the birth of freedom. And what do I mean by freedom? Well, he's saying, come and be with me. If you were working for identity, don't anymore. Like, I, I give you one. If you were working for a name, if you were working for significance, don't anymore. I'll give you one. When people see you, they'll see me. When people know you, they'll know me. Now, some of you hear that and you're like, man, that's great. Like, I've been on this treadmill. I've been laboring. I've, I've been trying to make myself important. I've been trying to make a name for myself. Here, God, take it. I love your response. That's a beautiful response. It's not the response of anyone up on this stage right now. <laughs> what do I mean by that? For some reason, there are those others of us that we like control. And I love Jesus' invitation. I'm just being honest with you, but part of my flesh is like, but I kind of want to be in control too. Like, can I give you the things that I don't want to do? Can I, like, do up my list and I'll control this part of my life and those things that kind of bore me or are a little hard, like, I'll give to you? 
But we find out in this, Jesus says, no, you got to give it all to me. Like all of it. There's a guy in that genealogy, and his name is Jacob. And even if you've come here today and you don't know much about Jesus and you're just here because somebody kept inviting you and you're like, okay, I'll come. You may have heard of Jacob before. And Jacob and his story in the Bible is an interesting one. You know what Jacob's name means? Deceiver. Okay? We've talked in here before and you might not have been here. I have a pretty just vanilla name and it means lives by a creek, but I'll take that over deceiver. Okay? <laughs> But Jacob was a schemer and a controller. He'd fool his dad. He'd fool his brothers. He would try to trick anyone and everyone so he could keep control. But then he meets God. And when he meets God, like he literally meets God, it says that he wrestles with him. If you wonder who God is, look at this. He wrestles with you. He wrestles with him. They strain and struggle together. You have big questions? God isn't afraid of those. You want to wrestle with him? You want to talk with him about them? He says, come on. And at the end of it, God says, I'm going to change your name. You're not going to be deceiver anymore. You're going to be Israel, which means wrestles with God. Now, in this moment, it precedes a really remarkable moment in Jacob's life. Like, Jacob has really messed with his brother. Like, he's tricked him and fooled him and robbed him of his birthright. And now they're grown up, and they haven't seen each other in a long time. And he finds out Esau, his brother, has an army. Like, an army. Part of me has been afraid of this because my younger sister, right below me, I wasn't always the nicest. She hated mice, you know that? Hated them, deathly afraid of them. And where my basketball hoop was, um, there was a little field, there were always mice. So often in the morning, and, and I'm, I'm sorry if you're a mouse lover, I would just hit a mouse with my basketball. And take it in and greet her, okay? And I greeted her in different ways. Sometimes it was on her dresser. Sometimes it was on out in front of her. Not the kindest thing. When I've read this, I've worried someday about her having an army. <laughs> Esau had an army. Like, literally, like, he's rich. All kinds of men work for him. And he's moving towards Jacob. And Jacob's had this night where he's wrestled with God. And he can be the deceiver in this moment. Or he can be the one who trusts God. And he steps into this. And God provides. Reconciliation with Esau. Reunion with Esau. Esau doesn't come to put him down. Rather, they actually reconcile. See, God is offering us freedom at Christmas. Well, whatever that thing is that identifies us, that we feel like we have to keep perpetuating, he's saying, let it go. Give it to me. And for some of us, again, that's going to be easy. For others of us right now, we're holding it tight. But I would ask you, is it going to save you? Is it going to provide you salvation, healing, redemption? Christmas is a big deal because it's the birth of truth. Look at this next part of the verse. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Some, some translations say the vine dresser. He's the one who takes care of this. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Now this is one that can be a little personal. Because God's getting specific. He's saying, I take care of my vine. And sometimes I prune it. That same uh, wine grower asked, well, what does this mean to you? He's like, well, Kyle, when, when, you, when you plant a new vineyard, when you plant a new vine, he says, and you watch it and you watch it, you take care of it, and you see it as it grows, and right when it's about ready to produce fruit, you cut it. I was like, well, that's ridiculous, right? Don't you want to see the grapes? 
He's like, if you think that's crazy, you keep watching it. That second year, you, grow, you, 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 you do everything you can to make it thrive and thrive and thrive. And right when it's about ready to produce fruit, you cut it back. For someone who likes to get things done and see results, I'm like, this just seems crazy, right? And he's like, the good, the patient winemakers, they'll even do it a third year. They'll let it get strong, and it looks amazing, and it's about ready to produce the fruit. You cut it again. Because what you're doing, he says, is you are preparing that vine to be so robust, so strong, so complex, so flavorful, so fruitful, that if you just let it begin to bear fruit right off the beginning, you'll never get that moment back. And that made me think of God. I'm always kind of in a hurry. Like, I want to be on time. I want to figure things out. I want to get it right. Because I read the Bible, and I've read it quite a bit. One guy that's never in a hurry is God. Like, think about it. He brings Jesus, and we see him in the manger, and we even see a couple of little things when he's a kid. Other than that, he's like, yeah, I think I'll wait 30 years. When do you want to kick this off, God? Like, Jesus is here? I don't know, 30 years sounds good. I don't like my wife to read this part because she says we don't need to be in such a hurry all the time. Sometimes she struggles with being on time, so I'm like, yes, we do, Right? But God doesn't, that guy Jacob we talked about, when he went to find his wife, he finds his wife and he talks to her dad and, you know, it's a whole different day back then. They negotiate an agreement. He's like, I'll work for you for seven years. Seven years he works for this guy so that he can marry his wife. And then the dad gives him a different daughter, which is really messed up, whole totally different sermon, right? And he's like, you gave me the wrong daughter. The guy's dead. Now, you know. He's like, well, if you really want the other one, you've got to work another seven years. But God is never in a hurry. It seems to be that he wants to produce the best fruit. That he wants it when it comes out, that it is so flavorful, it is so robust, it is so complex, that our mind can't begin to comprehend where it came from. It must be only God. Is what at Christmas this year I want an ornament on our tree that's that's pruning shears, you know? Like what do I mean by that? We in our house almost all of our ornaments tell a story. I can almost see like these were the ornaments before kids, mostly because we keep them high and they're not broken. Then after they're all you know break proof for a while. But they tell a story. But I'm like, this just seems to be the story at Christmas, especially in a time that we talk about waiting produces fruit my wife and my boys love to garden and they have the the big pruning shears and then they have the small little snips and as someone who can't really garden or grow much i'm always like why do they need all these there's like eight different types of them but i see them out there working with them and then i see us and we're all different some of us need to get the, the, the the big branch lopped off right That's the thing that we know and everybody knows, man. That needs to be shaped and transformed. That kind of needs to go away. But then there are those little moments, those little spaces. Sometimes we didn't even know they were there, and God's like, hey, I want to cut that. I want to remove that. I want to bring out more fruit in you. And that kind of needs to go. There's a woman in that genealogy. And her name is Rahab. She's a Gentile, which meant she was not a Jew. And at the time, the Jews, the Israelites, they're trying to take their land and they move into a space and place and they need her help. And she has a moment in this where she can say yes to God or she can say no to God. And she says yes to God. And her story before this moment is she's a prostitute. That's her name. That's her label. That's what everybody knows her as. And she says yes to God. And she helps the people of God. And she trusts the living God. And we read her name thousands of years later. 
not as a prostitute, but as a grandmother of Jesus. When we begin to trust God's transformation, things completely change. And our old names and our old ways go away. And when we let him prune and when we let him cut, fruit is promised from us that changes everything. It says this as he continues. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes And he produces every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. See, the first part is the birth of freedom. And then we get the birth of transformation when he's pruning. And then what he says is, if I keep doing that, it's going to produce amazing fruit. But why does he do it? He doesn't do it for us. He doesn't do it so we can look and just say, man, you see all the fruit I'm producing? You see how great I am? He does it so that we will bless others. It's the birth of freedom and the birth of transformation. And it's the birth of true, like, God-authored blessing. Like, I think of Mary in the genealogy. Like, she literally gives up her body to bless us. Think about that. Now, now, I've loved my wife literally from the beginning. Like, we started dating, and I was kind of head over heels for her. And then we get married, and um, we had 11-plus years before we had children. And so we got to be, like, just best of friends, like, dialed in. And I'll be honest, like, I kind of mark our relationship before kids and after kids. Not just because of what kids are, but because who I got to see who she is in that moment of giving birth. See, before I saw that moment of giving birth, I thought I kind of had an idea what birth was, but I had no idea. Before she gave birth, like, I'll be honest, I had a healthy dose of fear of her. After, it was much bigger. (laughs) Right? Like, I remember that day so poignantly. And I remember watching her bring this life into the world, and I was like, what just happened? Right? God's unbelievable wisdom. In creating a body, in letting women bring forth and bless the world with children. Like, it's so profound. I think of Mary in this. As he comes to her, engages her, she she steps into it like Jacob. She doesn't have to be an old man like him. She's a young girl. She says, I'll trust you, God. She lets him shape and transform her, right? Like she's giving up her body. She's giving up her reputation. She may be giving up her marriage. She doesn't know that yet. But she's saying, I'll give it to you, God. And then she's basically saying, bless others through me, God. She sacrifices her body. Which is this foretelling of her son. Who would give his body to save Everyone. She's blessed to be a blessing. I think most of you know this. We're in the first few months of our church. One of the biggest prayers that I have is that we will be a church who recognizes that how God has blessed us, the fruit that he's given us and he's allowed us to bring will call us and compel us To bless the world that we live in. To shower blessing on the Ojai Valley, on Ventura County. To go anywhere he calls us around the globe. Not to tell our story, but to tell this same story. It's my prayer that whether Refuge Church lasts two years or 20 years or 200 years, that whenever it leaves, people will go, something is missing. The blessing that God was moving in this is gone. We want to be a church who's blessed to be a blessing. Not to tell our story, but to tell this story. It's been changing, thing, changing lives for thousands of years. It says, every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. 
And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Folks, look at that. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. Throughout the passage, you heard it as I read it, there's multiple times where Jesus stops and focuses on if there are branches that aren't engaged, that aren't participating, that God says, I got to get that away. See, and maybe you look at that and you're like, that seems cold or harsh, but that's what a good vine dresser does. That's what a smart father does. Like, you want to produce good fruit? You want to tell the story of freedom, of transformation, of, 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 of blessing? And it has to be a place of protection and refuge. It's the birth of refuge. Like where we can really trust God. And know that he will provide protection for us. Why is this a big deal? Well, we live in a world and we live in a valley. We live in a valley that has given itself to so many other things but God. Like, that's not a secret. And we want to be a church that doesn't hide in here, that doesn't grow the walls high and just say, come hang out in here. We want to be a church that moves into this valley tells the world about Jesus, invites them to know him. And folks, in reality, just speaking honestly, there will be resistance. We will need protection. We will need his provision. There's another woman in that genealogy, and her name is Ruth. And she's not an Israelite either. She's from an area called Moab. And there's a moment in the midst of a famine where she says, I'm going to trust you, God. Wherever you send me, I'm going to go. You're going to be my God. And she is completely dependent on God to provide her bread, let alone um, sustenance for the rest of her life. Step by step, day by day, he offers her refuge, protection, provision. This is why Christmas is a big deal. The verse ends up like this. It says, as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Look at this. It's like I've told you this. I've invited you into this so that your joy, your fulfillment may be complete. This is the birth of freedom, of transformation, of blessing, of refuge, and finally of promise. That that, that wherever that need is in you, wherever that pit is, wherever that desire is, that ultimately every one of us in here, when we trust him, our joy will be made complete. One of the most powerful stories in that genealogy that we, we say his name, but we don't really talk about him that much, is Joseph. Think about it. Mary's husband, Joseph. He finds the girl he wants to marry. And he's excited about that. And what happens? She comes to him one day. She's like, hey, little curveball. I'm pregnant. But I wasn't with anybody. And I'm sure he was like, of course you weren't, right? And God shows up. Confirms her story. And what does he do? He says, okay, we're going to live this out. I'm going to serve her. I'm going to love her. I'm going to play whatever part you have for me in this story, God. Think about it. Like, we don't don't talk much about with Joseph. Even like you, you see him in the nativity scene, and he seems to usually be the least engaged guy. Like Mary's always down there. Sometimes she has a platter of pitcher of water, which I'm always like, why? And uh, she's like going to pour water in Jesus. But uh, the, 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 the um, wise men have gifts. 
The shepherds have the lambs, and they're easily looking in, and Joseph's just usually, like, you know, standing like this. And he tells one of the most beautiful stories of it. He just trusts God. Because he knows that in that, his joy will be complete. We always aren't promised the ending. We don't know what it will look like. It doesn't end following Jesus with, you know, with, um, at the end of our life, we're celebrities with, with just as much money as we want in our dreams. And everybody knows us and thinks we're amazing. No, what's promised to us is union with God. And that our joy will be complete. And in a moment, we get a chance to respond. And that's, that's one of my things that I, I hope we, you see here at Refuge as you continue to come, is that this isn't a spectator sport. So we don't just come and listen and then go to lunch after and go thumbs up, thumbs down, and eh, kind of in the middle. But we hear the word of God, and we go, let's respond. And that's why we come to the table every week. It's because Jesus is always saying, follow me, know me. He told us, do this every time you get together. It's not something we thought about in a creative meeting. We're like, what if we did this? No, Jesus says, do this, respond. You can respond in prayer. Tim's going to be down here to my right at this table. You want to pray with him about that freedom idea or pruning or blessing, whatever it is, come and respond. Worship. You can sing out. And again, I know it's bright in here, but if you like to put your hands in the air, put your hands in the air. People aren't looking at you going like, I can't believe she put her hands in the air. Right? If you want to pray, pray. Folks, this story, it changes everything. So if you want to respond, if you want to be begin living it, if you look like you're drunk, like, I'll, I'll, I'll vouch for you, okay? <laughs> if you just want to trust him wherever he sends you, that's the radical invitation of Christmas that has been changing everything for thousands of years. Let's pray. God, you are so good. The fact that you, you would come and live among us and then invite us to live as one with you and, and your Father and the Spirit is an unbelievable invitation. We know that only you can provide that, God. So we thank you for that. We trust you for that. God, will you move in that now? Will you help us to have conviction as we respond? Will your spirit fill us just like it did thousands of years ago with Peter and the other followers, God, so that we would step out into our day-to-day -day lives, whether it's in our homes, whether it's in our workplace, wherever you send us, Lord. And the people would go, man, they look like little Christs. They're living a story that we don't really often see. God, thank you for this time. Would you be with us? We praise you.